my name is Miles Dyer. I am YouTube's UK ambassador for Creators for Change, one of many inspiring people who use their online channels to talk about issues that matter to them uh, and try and take it to wider audiences all around the world. Uh, and today I have the pleasure of talking to Secretary General's Youth Envoy, uh, Yay Afma. Thank you for joining me. Um, and I thought before we start, just give a bit of an introduction of what you do in your work and um, maybe some examples of particular campaigns you've worked on recently. Sure. Um, so thanks again for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. My name is Jayatma Vikramanayak and I am the UN Secretary General on Know Your Youth. I know that title sounds very confusing. Uh, so my job is to bring the United Nations closer to young people and bring young people closer to the UN. In doing so, I bring to the attention of the United Nations, the member states, the ministers, the diplomats that work for the United Nations, the issues, the needs, the concerns and rights of young people most importantly, across the four pillars that we work on. That is in sustainable development, in peace and security, in humanitarian action and in human rights. Um, so I do this a lot by doing global advocacy, of course, at the United Nations and outside the United Nations. Um, and I also run um, certain campaigns that recognize youth leadership and young people's agency, innovation and creativity. Um, you asked for examples. So one of the examples is every year my um, office uh, runs a campaign called Young Leaders for Sustainable Development, where we recognize 17 young leaders from across the globe who contribute to achieving uh, one or more sustainable development goals. Um, I also house a global campaign called Not Too Young to Run um, that encourages young people to run for a political office. But also in many countries across the globe, we have age restrictions when it comes to young people's political participation. That means you can vote when you're 18 or 21 in some countries, yeah. but you can't run for office un until you turn 40 years. 40? So in some countries, yes. Like what? Um, um, in Nigeria, really? for an example, um, and actually it's, um, they just reduced that to 35, but still there's a long way to go. 73% uh, wow. of the national parliaments actually have age restrictions that prevent young people from running for office. Um, so I host this campaign called Not Too Young to Run, um, which I use to advocate with governments to reduce those age limitations so that every young person can en enjoy the right of political participation. Wow. And so when you work with young people on the topic of gender equality, and especially when it comes to running and trying to get into the political process, right. what have you found has been the disparities between guys and girls? Yeah, so I mean, um, especially I think it's a, a, a public secret that young women face um, uh, dis more discrimination than men, for an example, not just in p running for a political office, but many other processes as well. But young women particularly face discrimination, one, due to their gender, two, due to their age. In most of the instances when, where we have quotas, for an example, when there's a quota for women and when there's a quota for young people, usually this young people's quota is taken up by young men and women's quota is taken by much older, mature women. So young women always get left out in that process. So um, in, I'm originally from Sri Lanka and before joining the United Nations, I worked together with a number of young people on a campaign called Hashtag Generation. That is about us as millennials, how do we convert hashtags into concrete action? So our campaign was to mobilize as many as young women to run for political office. But this campaign at first was not very successful um, due to various reasons. So we um, did some uh, deeper research into it as to why young women were reluctant in, to run for office. And we found that there are three layers of barriers that prevent their participation. The first layer was that they lacked self-confidence. Uh, none of them thought that um, they could actually do a good job at yes. uh, holding a public office. Some were extremely afraid to uh, publicly speak or stand up for a value or a political ideology that they believed in. And the second uh, barrier was the social barrier, where their family, friends, and people in the society telling them that politics was not a good vocation for a woman, especially in a patriarchal society yes. like South Asia, uh, who is going to take care of your kids when you are away most of the time of the day. Um, politics can get violent uh, in our part of the world. So um, a lot of that um, prevented them from um, 
even having an interest in running for office. Third and the most shocking revelation for us was that in the political party structures, we didn't have any women leaders. Right. So if you don't have women within the political parties themselves, then it's kind of difficult for new young women to enter into these yeah, political they feel like parties. Yeah, it's not for them. Exactly. Yeah. And also there's no one to advocate for them within the political parties yes. themselves and you need the backing of a political party to be on a list or to be nominated. Right. So these are some of the big issues that we try to tackle, of course, as a grassroots organization. But um, I'm glad to see now, for an example, in this space, I've met so many movements and organizations of young people taking initiative to tackle some of these issues. So I'm also interested in asking you, since Go you are a, a social media expert, um, how can we maybe use social media as a tool? Because we know even in the furthest corners of, say, Africa or Asia, young people do have access to social media. Yes. And how can we use this as a positive platform to encourage more young people to kind of break these glass ceilings, especially young women, yeah. especially when it comes to civic and political participation? Sure. Well, sort of some background in terms of my experience with YouTube was I joined it 12 years ago and I was sort of a, a first generation YouTuber. I was 18, 19 years old. I thought this seems like a cool website. And over the years, I found out that this is an empathy machine. It is this tool that allows you between the fabrics of online video that is uploaded, there are these communities that gather. And what it would mean is that whereas before with traditional media, you would have this kind of singular sort of interest where this is popular music, this is popular politics. We now have niches where you could be into something that you're the only one in your town likes, but you can now connect with millions of people around the world who have that similar thing. And I think that's really decentralizing many power structures around the world and creates great opportunities for organizations. And so actually, in some ways, I've organized with uh, political movements around the world, uh, whether it's um, uh, in the uprisings in Turkey, um, where the internet was shut down, I was able to retweet some of the information coming out. I wasn't there, but I could do it as an ally from abroad. And I think that young people today really understand that potential. And I think that by experimenting with the platform, they're able to realize that it's no longer about having a voice in your local community, but more about taking those learnings in your local community and sharing it globally. Right. So, I mean, you, for an example, yeah. along these thousands of young people, have used uh, social media as a positive platform yes. to inculcate social good, send out a positive message. Yeah. But we also see a lot of young people, young women, especially a research done in EU revealed that one in 10 young women between 15 to 24 had experienced some kind of harassment or violence in a digital space. Yes. So this is also becoming very evident and, and very common. So what are some of the tips that you can give to me or to other young people watching yeah. as to how, should, how responsible should we be when we use uh, major sure. platforms, mass platforms like this? Well, well, going back to the fact that I said that I joined YouTube 12 years ago, I mean, in the grand scheme of like human existence, that is such a short period of time. And what we found is this explosion of interaction and there's a lot of positive and there's a lot of negative. And I think it comes to the heart of our education systems. And that doesn't necessarily mean the traditional within the schools, but just with what is available online. And so I work for a campaign called Be Internet Citizens that's talking about emotional manipulation uh, and, and, and promoting the importance of empathy because often people engage with others in ways that you wouldn't in real life. And I am still shocked all these years later of some of the vitriol I see, especially against women, um, on these online platforms and so kind of like we talk about the bystander effect in everyday life if you see something happening on the train you should step in in some ways it's it, it can be even harder to do it online because you think that's just the way it is and the truth is that doesn't have to be the way it is and there's something we can do about it no, definitely, I agree. Maybe one other thing that I want to sure. build up on this on the same topic is, of course, definitely on social media, we see young people taking up, majority of young people, I would say, on a positive role. But if you wake up in the morning and turn on the kind of the mainstream media, like the televisions, the radio stations, or even the newspapers sometimes, all we see is kind of the, this portrayal of a negative image of young people, yes. either as lazy or as checking their phones and laptops all the time or say in a conflict setting always to be on the side of perpetrators of the violent group or on the side of the victims yes. but Miles in reality I meet thousands of young people across all parts of the world but 
I would say 99% of young people that I meet are actually very positive agents of change who want to live peacefully yes. and who do want to contribute to the betterment of our societies. So how do you think as netizens yes. we can play a role in kind of changing this narrative of yeah. young people being um, passive beneficiaries sure. of, of, of this world into really showcasing them as the active contributors as they are? Yeah. Unfortunately, I've just got a nod that we're going to have to wrap this up, but I actually think the question that you ask is really important. And actually, the answer is in the question, which is, it's about controlling your own narrative. The decentralization of power structures, whether it's energy systems or political systems, uh, uh, and information, it means that people can go out with their own stories and get it out there because there'll be other people in the world that say, this speaks to me, this is my story. And people that are geographically isolated can actually come together in a digital platform organize and then go back into their local spaces uh, and make change for good once more. I want to thank you so much for your time. Thank and you we're so going to have much. lots more conversations after this. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much.